Hello, viewer. Thanks for taking a moment to watch this video among the many other things you could be doing on your computing devices. Speaking of computing devices, have you ever thought, how does a computer work? Well, good news, because this video will hopefully give you a basic understanding of how computers work. To begin, let's take a look at electricity on the atomic level. As you might know, atoms are made of protons, which have a positive charge, and electrons, which have a negative charge. Atoms also have neutrons, however, neutrons don't have a charge, so they don't matter for the purposes of this discussion. So, back to protons and electrons. At the center of an atom is the nucleus, which is where the protons hang out. Electrons, on the other hand, float around the nucleus. Atoms, in their standard state, have an even number of protons and electrons. So, let's say we have an atom with four protons, which, if you remember, have a positive charge. Thus, there must be four electrons so that the negative charge of the electrons cancels out the positive charge of the protons. At this point, the atom has no charge because the positive and negative charges of the protons and electrons balance each other out. But let's suppose that we add an electron. Suddenly, the atom doesn't have enough protons to balance out the negative charge of the fifth electron, which makes the atom negatively charged. The opposite happens if you take away an electron. You'll have more protons than electrons, making the atom positively charged. So great, atoms can have charges, but where do the extra electrons that give the atom a charge come from? Well, some types of atoms are more willing to give up their electrons than others. You might have noticed electrical wires are made up of a protective rubber-like coating with metal strips inside. Electricity usually involves metals, because metals are more willing to give up their electrons. We call these substances conductors. Conductors are made up of a bunch of atoms all stringed together that want to give up their electrons. So when you plug a cord into an outlet, the outlet gives electrons to the metal atoms that it touches. Since metal atoms like to give up electrons, the electrons travel from one atom to another all the way from one end of the wire to the other. This is how electricity works. It's a bunch of electrons hopping from one atom to the next. You probably know that electricity is dangerous, but then why do we touch cables all the time and not get shocked? Remember that rubber-like coating that I mentioned earlier? Well, there are atoms that don't like to give up electrons, such as rubber, and we call these insulators. Wires have a protective coating of insulators covering them so that electricity travels down the metal wire and doesn't shock you when you touch them. This is because the insulator is stopping the flow of electricity from going out of the wire and into you. All this is pretty crazy, huh? Tiny little things we can't see flowing around. Well, welcome to the world of science. So, we talked about conductors and insulators, but how do these relate to computers? Well, we need one more bit of information before we can tackle computers. So, conductors like to give up electrons, but insulators don't. There are other types of atoms, called semiconductors, that are in between conductors and insulators. Sometimes they like to give up their atoms, but other times they want to keep them all to themselves. So, they are neither conductors or insulators. They're sort of a middle ground, hence the word semiconductor. Computers today use a semiconductor that goes by the name of silicon. Since silicon doesn't know whether to share or not to share its electrons, we use a process called doping, where we slightly modify silicon to tend toward giving up or keeping electrons. Silicon is doped in two different ways. When doped to want to keep its electrons, it's called a p-type semiconductor. When doped to want to share its electrons, it's called an n-type semiconductor. Now remember, it's still a semiconductor, so doping just changes the tendencies of the silicon. We aren't turning it into an insulator or a conductor. Silicon doping is a very complex concept, but the basic explanation I've provided is all you need to know for this video. So, we have silicon, which is doped into two different states, p-type, which keeps electrons, and n-type, which shares electrons. We bring these together and create the most basic unit of a computer, the transistor. We take our n-type and we put it on the ends and sandwich the p-type between them. On one side of the transistor, there is the source, which is where the electricity comes from. On the other side of the transistor is the drain, which is where the electricity is trying to flow to. But remember, the electricity is trying to flow through a doped semiconductor. The electricity flows fine through the n-type because it wants to pass along electrons. But once we reach p-type, we have a problem. Where the n-type and the p-type touch, they cancel each other out, basically making a wall that stops electrons from flowing from the source to the drain. This electron block is called the depletion zone. Now what? The electrons can't flow through, but this is actually on purpose. On the top of the transistor is what's called the gate. When a positive charge is applied to this gate, it attracts the electrons across the depletion zone, effectively shrinking the depletion zone. This allows electrons to flow freely from the source to the drain. 
the gate is used kind of like a light switch. When the gate is off, electricity can't flow through. But when the gate is turned on, electricity can flow through. Well, so what? If you've ever heard that computers use zeros and ones, this is where they come in. Whenever the transistor is in the off state, it is a zero. Whenever it is in the on state, it's a one. This is called binary and is a way to communicate data kind of like Morse code. Morse code uses dots and dashes to convey a message. Computers work in a similar way. We line a bunch of these transistors up and we can get strings of zeros and ones. If you still don't get it, let's use Morse code for a second. In Morse code, the letter F is dot dot dash dot. Let's just say that in computers, a zero equals a dot and a one equals a dash. So if we have four transistors lined up, then the first two would be in the off state, which is zero. So we have zero, zero. The next transistor would be in the on state, which is a one. So now we have zero, zero, one. The final transistor would be in the off state, and thus a zero. So we put it all together, and we have zero, zero, one, zero. And that's F in Morse code. Obviously, computers do a lot more than display singular letters. They have millions to billions of transistors all lined up so that they can do complex math, display color, output sound, etc. Depending on what the computer is doing, the combinations of zeros and ones can mean different things. So, say that your computer is doing math in your central processor. 01001110 would mean 46. But say you are trying to display a video. That same combination of zeros and ones in the graphics portion of your computer would stand for a specific shade of green. So, transistors can express data, but what does this do? Well, computers are pretty much all math and logic which they achieve by stringing along a bunch of transistors in different configurations. There are a bunch of different configurations called gates, including AND, OR, NAND, and NOR. Gates are named after what they do. So AND gates are similar to the word AND in English. In English, AND considers two things at the same time. An AND gate does something similar by stringing two transistors together. Electrons try to flow from the source to the drain of the first transistor, then they move to the source of the second transistor and try to make it to the drain. So, if both transistors are off, which means two zeros, electrons won't be able to make it to the final drain, so the AND gate will output a zero. If one transistor is on, which is a one, and one is off, which is a zero, then the electrons stop at the off transistor and won't be able to make it all the way through, resulting in a zero. If both transistors are on, which makes two ones, then the electrons will be able to flow all the way through, thus, the AND gate will spit out a 1. So, transistors can be configured in different ways to make different logic gates that spit out 1s and zeros. And remember that 1s and zeros strung together make numbers, letters, and color. Thus, by stringing together a bunch of logic gates and patterns, computers can do math and complete complex instruction sets created by computer engineers and programmers that result in the numbers, letters, and colors that computers calculate and display. And that is how a computer works.